Good evening. Welcome to the glorious new ACT offices. No, um, <laughs> I wish that would be a dream. So welcome to the AstraZeneca building here um, on the biomedical campus in Cambridge. It's so lovely to have seen so many familiar um, and friendly faces as you've all come in. I'm thrilled. I don't know how I'm going to get away this evening without um, talking to you all. It's going to be a long night because uh, I've, there's so many of you I can't wait to catch up with, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction as to why we're here this evening, but this uh, wonderful facility that AstraZeneca have kindly allowed us to use this evening houses 2,300 scientists who are here doing drug discovery. And the reason why AstraZeneca chose to be here is because Cambridge has the best clinicians, the best professors, uh, the best academics, we know that this is the place to be. And tonight you're going to hear from some of the best. And I'm really excited uh, that we have three excellent speakers who, in their own right, like AstraZeneca, reimagine patient care here at Addenbrooke's every day. So you'll hear about their innovations and their research and their determination to make an impact on our patients. Uh, supporting ACT isn't just about robots and uh, staff spaces and counselling and equipment. It really is about the whole plethora of healthcare that happens here. And as a charity, we raise money also to, to support research. And a lot of the research we support is seed funding. So we help them start their idea and then go on to raise, hopefully, lots more funds to complete their studies. So really, uh, we know hospitals that use research, have better outcomes for patients. And we know that research is the bedrock upon which our future health depends. It's going to play a crucial role in us developing cures for diseases and also to improve patient care. And you'll hear more of that this evening from the speakers. I think the other thing I really should say is I want you to feel extremely proud of what you have all enabled by being in this room and also the support that you give to Addenbrooke's Charitable Trust and the hospitals here in Cambridge. Uh, I'm no doubt that on listening to this, you'll feel that you have a renewed sense of, of vigor and admiration for all the fabulous work that happens here. Um, there are pledge cards, and I know some of you already pledged to us, so if you feel inclined to fill it in, please do go ahead, and if you have a friend that you'd like to take it home and share it with, then also that's, that's equally fine. Um, complete them if you want to, talk to one of the team. We'll be around afterwards just to talk to you anyway and catch up with you. That's my job to catch up. I've got a lot to catch up with you all on. Um, and really just enjoy this evening. Research is about finding out more and wanting to learn more. So tonight you are actually all researchers in your own right and you can leave here having researched a little bit more about the topics we're going to hear. So who are we hearing from tonight now? Professor Ken Paul, who is a professor consultant in rheumatology and metabolic bone disease. Um, at, Ken has worked with ACT for many years, and uh, he's going to share a snapshot of some of the research that you have enabled. Um, I'm also going to say about Ken that he sits on our research advisory panel and decides how we do spend the money. So Ken's one of the, the superheroes that gives a bit of extra time to help ACT in its charitable endeavours. So thanks for that, Ken, and for being here tonight. Then we're going to hear from uh, Professor Matt Silbauer, who is a clinical professor of paediatric gastroenterology, who is doing incredible things in his laboratory. And I've heard him uh, talk a few times, and the last time I heard him, I knew that he was going to be on the JAL um, this year, and uh, my team quickly got to Matt and, and we got in his diary early. So thank you for being here, Matt. I know you have a lot, a lot of things on and your time is, is under pressure, so we appreciate that. Um, and to top it off, we then have Dr. Sue Broster, who uh, will tell you she's not a superhero, but she really is, because she is a, neo a consultant neonatologist in her spare time and saves 
teeny tiny babies, but she'll show you how teeny tiny. But she is also our Executive Director for Innovation and Digital Improvement at CUH, which uh, may sound a bit boring, but it's far from it because what Sue has in the palm of her hand on one day is a small baby, and on the other day it's the future of the NHS. So uh, she's got big hands and uh, a big job to do, and we look forward to hearing from her. So. I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to invite Ken with his mic. He's very, very pleased with this mic because he's normally in band mode when he's on a mic. So uh, tonight he's going to be in professor mode. So over to you, Ken. Thank you, Shelley. And, uh, and thanks for the invite to speak tonight. It's a huge pleasure because tonight um, I get to say thank you. That's all I'm doing and, and showing you what happened when we took one of our seeds of research and it met the soil and the water of ACT. We throw a lot of seeds out and the one that got taken by ACT and supported tonight is what I want to tell you about. I've already seen my old friend Adrian Dixon, Professor of Radiology here, who I know he will approve of this first slide. It is a CT scanner because he was responsible for getting us the first in, in, in Adam Brooks. And um, if I go one further, I will show you that um, now we're doing an extraordinary 50,000 or more CT scans a year at Adam Brooks and Papworth sites. And the seed idea was that we have in every CT scanner as you go through it, the entire spine is shown, whether it's showing through the chest, the abdomen, or the pelvis, we get a bit of spine, and I'm interested in trying to prevent osteoporosis. This is a 3D print made from a CT scan of somebody's spine with osteoporosis, which I'll talk about later. And as the radiologists in the room will know, that it's more common for CT scans to be seen like this. This is the axial view, the cuts. And in fact, the first ever CT scans invented by Godfrey Hounsfield would take just one five-minute slice through a brain. Here is the sagittal view that allows people like me to see the spine. And I'm very pleased because... Um, we can see the skeleton all the time and the very um, fracture that we're most keen to find from osteoporosis is the vertebral fracture. This is the normal spine and here's where the vertebrae have collapsed. And this is um, something that we're passionate about trying to prevent. In osteoporosis, the bones are thin and porous and they're more likely to break, especially in the spine. And when we talk about people being little and being hunched over, it can be often due to osteoporosis. So CT really does give us a 3D view. Uh, thanks to the Adam Brooks Charitable Trust and the Alborada Trust, we've been able to 3D print people's vertebrae. And I think that these 3D models of a patient before and after their vertebral fractures, there's four in here, show very well the effect on the structure of somebody's body. And if we just zoom in, the places where the fractures have happened are here, but the effect on the back of the vertebrae as well is very, very marked. And if anyone comes to my clinic, they'll be used to me doing these two tests, which I do practically everybody who comes in with osteoporosis, to find out whether someone can stand up against the wall with their head or whether they have a forward um, occiput distance and whether they can get two or three fingers in this space between their ribs and their pelvis. If they can't, then, then it's often a sign of osteoporosis. There's 200,000 fractures a year of the spine, and this number's going up about 5% a year, the number of people admitted with vertebral fractures. But this is what I want to talk to you about. 70% of these never come to clinical attention. And that's because people are really stoic, their back hurts, and they don't seek any um, attention. But if it goes on, and if the vertebrae collapse so that there's a kyphosis, which is the bend in the spine, then the, as the angle of the spine goes up and the curve gets more, the quality of life goes down. So we have to find them. This is not just an inevitable part of growing older. It's not. It's tr treatable and it's preventable. And the reason why the Queen was interested in these models when the Royal Osteoporosis Society was launched was because of her mother, Rosalind Shand, um, who you can see in these two pictures going from an upright individual to, um, to somebody who had severe osteoporosis and actually died from osteoporosis. And that's why she walked to find the Royal Osteoporosis Society and that's why she got, invests all of her time uh, that she has in being the patron of that society in a brilliant manner. It is not all bad news. 
osteoporosis almost could be seen as reversible. There are new drugs to prevent fracture and help it grow, both the, th the shell of the bone and inside the honeycomb of vertebrae. This is a study we did. I've got a small Adam Brooks Charitable Trust thing to thank for. It's a different part of my research, but we developed a method of measuring the 3D structure of bone in, in women and men who are undergoing treatment and found that with one of our bone growing drugs, we could get about a 10 to 15% gain in a year but one, one of the newest ones called romososumab, which stimulates bone to grow everywhere, um, you've got 20% or more uh, bone growth in the vertebrae and, and almost no vertebral fractures in the year after starting this medication. So it's good news. And I just wanted to show you three patients that we treated recently with this new monoclonal antibody since we're in AstraZeneca. And it's the, it's the home of some great research in monoclonal antibodies. But this is a UCB drug that's when given to a patient who just bobbled along with her bone density, the bone density went out of the osteoporosis range into the normal range and she had no fractures. Our next patient had 17% increases. These are percentage increases we couldn't believe in bone density. And then another patient who lost a lot of bone with the menopause and then gained a lot of bone just with one year. And I've got another spot to add to that which goes, shows complete resolution of her osteoporosis. With osteoporosis, we want to try and find it in the scanner, and we've come up with this study, which Adam Brooks Charitable Trust helped us get off the ground. Picking up hidden osteoporosis effectively during normal CT imaging without additional x-rays. And academics in the room will know I called it Phoenix because it was our fifth attempt to get it funding, and it was from the flames that we got this grant funding. <laughs> Um, and this is an individual in the front row, Dan Chappell, who I have to thank for everything. And Adam Brooks Charitable Trust picked him up, found that he needed support for beyond his clinical technical job on um, CT analysis and developed some of his work, which I'm going to show you now. He should really be presenting, but if he doesn't mind, I will. This is the percentage that we were picking up in versatile fractures going through the CT scanner when we looked at it in 2013. And by 2017, between them, Emma Geraghty, Dan Chappell, and Judith Brown were able to move that to 80% pickup just through education initiatives and some other things that I'm going to talk about right now. Educational initiatives of the radiologist to say, please, you need to report these vertebral fractures and you need to say the word vertebral fracture and then we'll pick it up and we'll treat the osteoporosis in the people who are treated. But actually Dan added something excellent. He just said, say the letters VXP and on the thousands and thousands of scans coming through, if you say VXP, it'll feed into this research program, it'll feed into bone density measurements, and it'll feed into treatments. And so that's what happened. He was able to measure bone density on the scan that had already been done. He was able to measure if there was a vertebral fracture in, in the scan that was already done using software that we've now got fully embedded in all the NHS systems and available to anybody in the hospital. And we can do this routinely. That's just showing a spine fracture that's been shown as a wedge, a severe vertebral fracture, which we really need to get into one of those clinics and onto one of those new drugs as soon as we can. So what did we do? We went to, we don't just want to do stuff for the benefit of Cambridge, and there are lots of hard to reach areas that don't even have any osteoporosis services, particularly Peterborough and Huntingdon. So we went to centres which have very little representation and our own, and we ran a large study where Everything we need to do this study of whether we can pick up osteoporosis and treat it can be sent either electronically through emails and um, NHS net sending us the clinical information or the scan results can be sent and pictures directly through the exchange portal to us so we can gain everything in Cambridge to, to look after patients in Peterborough and Huntingdon or Bedford and Bury. And the patients were just invited to fill in a questionnaire. Fill in this questionnaire and it'll tell you if you want to know your bone health, you can. And they just came and gave us their thoughts on our research and whether they wanted to take part. And this is the headline results from our study, that if, if you were randomized to the arm that Dan was analyzing in, 54% of our responders needed treatment within a year, half of them, and 36% of them were on treatment within a year. We're trying to get that level up very high currently with an extra arm to our study where we take complete control of getting people into our services and leave general practice out of the equation. Um, not for a bad reason, for a really good reason, because we already know they need treatment. And then if, if you were in the other arms where we just sent out questionnaires or we did nothing, there were very few people found. So we've been able to show that this is really something that we can run out to um, a very much larger um, study in the UK. And that's what we're trying to do now. I'm going to finish because we've got three of us talking tonight and I, mine is a small part. But we have a free text entry 
on, uh, on our consent form so we can find out what people think of their research. And this um, person said, if it hadn't been for your study and the subsequent bone health check, I wouldn't have known about the four fractures as I was there because it, it seemed as if I had gallstones, gallbladder problems, so thank you for your health check. And what had happened was, and this is in fact the patient who we turned into the 3D spine models, she had been found to have four osteoporotic fractures which had seemed to be gallbladder problems because they sometimes cause pain all the way around the front or in a band of pain around her body. And I think she says what I want to say, which is thank you. Thank you to Adam Rick's Charitable Trust. Because if, if this sort of research is incredibly hard to fund, these sort, this sort of person where you're seeking to develop them from, a, from this level upwards, and, and Dan's now completely independent in my group, they're hard to find as well. And it's all been because of Adam Brooks Trust, Charitable Trust, and people like yourselves and your generosity. So thank you. I'm just going to check if there are any immediate questions. People might want to digest that because that was quite quite something. Thank you, Ken. Has anyone got any questions to start off with? We are going to have a Q&A at the end and a panel, so I'll just check very quickly. And if there isn't, right, you sit down and then I'll come back to you at the end. Um, thank you. That was brilliant. And it was a great... Um, a great tour of, of a study that started small and, and became big and impactful. So Ken, thank you. And thank you, Dan, for your work. Because I do actually remember when your, uh, your application to get the additional funding came in and Ken put some pressure on me. Um, but it seems like Ken was right. And uh, it, it's always hard to refuse Ken because he doesn't come often and he's very thoughtful in that. So uh, we're glad to have helped you, Dan. And if you need help again, come and talk to us. The charitable expenditure team are here tonight, so uh, you have my permission. Right, let's get Matt up. Uh, I'm gonna do the introduction now. So Matt is a university lecturer and honorary consultant in paediatric gastroenterology at the University of Cambridge and Cambridge University Hospitals. Supported by an MRC New Investigator Research Award, I don't want to spoil your, your conversation here, so I need to pick out the words carefully. There's a few words I can't actually spell or speak. Um, and Matt's in the context of inflammatory bowel disease, um, particularly with paediatrics, and I'm going to leave him to, uh, to wow you all, and I know he will, so prepare to be wowed. Right, I've been told how to hold the microphone, so I think that's correct. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, first of all, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I've only been given 10 minutes, and I intend to stick to my time. I will talk to you about three topics today. Inflammatory bowel diseases, epigenetics, and organoids, and how they all fit together. So after these 10 minutes, I hope that all of you have an understanding of these three subjects and how they fit together. Okay, let's start with inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, some of you may have heard of these conditions. They give you chronic inflammation of your intestine, of your gut. The two main entities are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. There are many differences between those, but roughly Crohn's disease can give you inflammation any part of your intestine, starting from the mouth all the way through. In ulcerative colitis, the inflammation is restricted to the large bowel or colon, hence the name colitis. I believe that these conditions, when they affect children, and they increasingly do affect children at a very young age, are some of the most severe and nasty conditions anyone can get. The conditions are rising globally, and we are seeing up to 30% of them affecting young children as young as five and lower years of age. The majority are diagnosed as teenagers. Um, there is no cure for these conditions. That means once they're diagnosed, the children will suffer from these conditions for a life. We don't have great treatments for those, partly because we don't know what's causing them and therefore 
the main approach is just to dampen down our immune system, which we know is certainly implicated in that. And just to give you a glimpse of what it means for a young person to be diagnosed with such a condition, there is no treatment that works continuously. In fact, up to 60% only efficacy of any given treatment. And even in those patients where treatment may work initially, after two, three years, they lose response. We start over again. That means that a lot of patients, especially with Crohn's disease, probably two thirds of them ultimately would need surgery. So imagine a 13 year old girl who's been diagnosed with Crohn's disease just a year ago, has tried on several treatments, some with some success, some failed, ultimately needs surgery. She had a part of her bowel removed and ended up with a stoma. In other words, the bowel leading out to her bowel, her, her abdominal wall, attached to a bag where then the stool is diverted out. That's just within a year of diagnosis. I mean, imagine such a child, young person, going out like her peers would do, meeting friends, going to a disco, wherever, party, explaining to her peers what that bag is doing. Um, and that, of course, doesn't have just an impact on the child, the young person. It affects the entire family. Parents are devastated. Siblings are affected. Their entire life is turned upside down. So just to give you a bit of a glimpse of how severe these conditions are, and hence our motivation to make things better. OK, that's IBD. Epigenetics. Quick hand sign. Who knows anything about epigenetics? Hand up, please. Oh, it's good, about 10%. All right, I'll try to communicate just the basic concept of epigenetics. I think it's really important. I believe that most of you will know about genetics. Everyone talks about genetics these days, about our genes, about our genetic code that determines everything. Well, I'll tell you, it determines something, that's for sure. Our genetic code determines what we are. So if you take the genetic code of a mouse and an ape, they're gonna be fundamentally different and you can't turn a mouse into an ape or vice versa. That's for sure. But if you look into the DNA of a cell that we take from a brain, from a liver or a gut, they're all the same. The genetic code in each cell of one organism is the same, identical. So what then determines to turn a cell into a brain, into a liver or a gut? Well, that's epigenetics. That's part of the modifications of the DNA molecule to determine what cell type that moves into. The same accounts actually for people, for example, these are identical twins, they have the same DNA, but they were exposed to completely different environments. And as you can see, they look completely different. Aging, diseases, all of these things determine what we look like, what happens to us without changing our genetic code just the way the genetic code is modified, epigenetics. These mice, again, have the same identical genetic code, but one has a disease, the other one doesn't. And the difference is the diet the mama mouse was exposed to during pregnancy. Environmental factors determine how the genetic code is modified and therefore whether one individual, in this case a mouse, gets a disease or the other not. Next step, how does epigenetics relate to IBD? Well, I've told you that the incidence of IBD has been skyrocketing in the recent decades. This is something that cannot happen with changes in our genome. It's far more stable. And we find that that increase in the incidence strongly correlates with the changes in our lifestyle. For example, the, the IBD incidences previously have only been skyrocketing in Western countries. Now we also see them in countries that adopt the Western lifestyle. So in other words, the incidence follows the change in our environment, in modern lifestyle, and that's complex, I appreciate that. But broadly speaking, and that's our overall hypothesis here, is that there's something in our environment that changes, and it has the ability to change our epigenome and therefore cause disease because these epigenetic changes are at some point also irreversible. And once you have that disease, it stays there. In this case, chronic gut disease. We are interested in a cell type that forms the inner lining of the gut. 
another, it's called intestinal epithelium. If you think about it, what our gut is exposed to over a lifetime, the factors changes quite dramatically. As babies, we have just milk, then there's an introduction of solid food, then there'll be toxins, and, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, all of these factors are required for our cell types to develop over time. But if something goes wrong, then that could carry severe consequences, in some cases diseases. In our case, we believe that can lead to IBD. So how can we study that? And that brings me to my third and last point, organoids. What are organoids? Generally speaking, you can think of them as mini intestines in a dish. So this is what we do. When we diagnose these children with inflammatory bowel diseases, they need to undergo an endoscopy. So we take a tiny little camera and look inside their bowels and take tiny little tissue samples. They're hardly visible. These tissue samples contain stem cells. Stem cells are rapidly dividing. And we can put them in a dish, expose them to the right growth factor mix, and they grow these unique and quite extraordinary three-dimensional structures that closely resemble the function and the structure in the gut. This is what they look like in real life under the microscope. So we can take them from different parts of the gut, we put them in the dish, and over several days only, they grow into these sort of three-dimensional shapes called the mini-gut. We've now grown these human mini-guts from nearly 1,000 children, and we've performed epigenetic profiling on them. And what we found is that every organoid has a unique epigenetic profile. And it's unique to every patient. It means it varies between patients. Moreover, we found that their signature, these epigenetic profiles, can tell us something about their disease, can tell us whether a child may experience a more severe disease or a mild disease. And when we expose these organoids to the same drug, from different patients, they respond differently, which we believe ultimately opens the opportunity that we can figure out whether a child or a patient responds to a certain drug or not using the organoids, rather than exposing the drug to the patient, exposing them very often, of course, unnecessarily side effects. And of course, the major psychological impact of undergoing lengthy unsuccessful treatment. So this is our vision, and I believe that it's a realistic vision in the next five to 10 years. So what we will do, as we currently do already in a research setting, but that should become clinical practice, we perform our endoscopy, we take the tissue samples, and we generate organoids from every patient. We then generate, so, and that's the other really cool thing about these organoids, you can freeze them down. You can put them in the freezer if you don't need them anymore. If a new drug comes available, or the patient you know, has a relapse, and a sort of a, a relapse of their disease, you can take them out, get them growing, and test something else. And we can test all different drugs on the organoids before we give them to the patient. Therefore, essentially personalizing our treatment, something that is sort of the holy grail of IBD treatment, but not just IBD. You take most complex diseases these days, everyone is facing the same problem. Heterogeneity, lots of treatments, no one knows what is the best for which patient. And I want to finish off by thanking the real heroes of the whole show. These patients that we grow organoids from are all children. And they volunteer to give us pieces of their gut for research purposes. But that's not enough. We have to tell them when we take their consent that we're gonna be doing research if you give us pieces of your bowel, but just to know it's unlikely, in fact, nearly impossible that it will have any benefit to yourself. Best case scenario is that your contribution may help other children in the future. And what always really stuns me is when I see worried parents saying, well, I'm not so sure, maybe I don't wanna consent. And the young person saying, no, I wanna help. Doesn't matter. It's okay if you can't help me, but I want to help others. And it's remarkable. We have a consent rate of over 90% of children and parents that help us. And we're trying to engage more with our parents and the patients um, because we believe this is extremely beneficial for both sides. 
And so, for example, we're organizing now every year these sort of junior scientists day where we bring some of our patients and their parents and siblings to our fancy shiny laboratory and they can have a day of playing with pipettes, extracting their DNA, looking under the microscope and getting a tour through the laboratory. And as a bonus, they get to lab to wear these cute lab coats. Um, and I think that's almost done. I hope I didn't run over. Last but not least, I have to thank my team, the clinical team, um, our collaborators research these days, no one does that on their own. And as Ken already said, Cambridge here is one of the most amazing environments to do that kind of research. Um, and of course, the various funding bodies, including ACT. Thank you. I mean, wow, did anyone have the wow factor with that? Well done, Matt. You actually did stick to time and you got across such an important story um, to share and we will have some time for questions afterwards. So thank you. I'm speechless. Right, Sue, that's a tough act to follow, but I know you will follow it well. Uh, we've got Sue Broster now, who is, um, as I said, the Executive Director for Innovation and Digital and Improvement, um, and also the consultant neonatologist. So, Sue, you are also a keen supporter of our global health programmes, and you help us with our innovation funding and spending. So, a great friend of ACTS and someone who is going to tell an amazing story now. So, over to you. This one? Yeah. Okay. It's always a good start, isn't it, when you're the director of digital and you can't get the technology to work. Anyway, right, we'll, we'll move on. So really nice to see everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming here this evening to, to listen to us, but also really to say a huge thank you to all of you um, for everything that you do to support us. I'm getting the sign that I need to hold my microphone, so I'm, if I drift off, let me know. I'll move back. So I think as we've, we've heard, innovation really does transform lives. I see that every day as a consultant neonatologist. For babies and families, babies the size of literally the size of my, the palm of my hand, 500 grams born as early as 22 weeks into a lady's pregnancy, who not just survive now, but actually thrive and go home because of the innovations and the technology and all the support that we can provide to both the babies, but also increasingly to their families to get those babies to go home. So we see that from ambulances to incubators, digital technologies right through to developmental care. And that's really what's led me on the journey to become so passionate about what innovation can do to transform the NHS. I just want to highlight where you've really made a difference to what I do every day. So I spent still quite a lot of my time in the back of that ambulance. Um, and that's really been supported by ACT, which allows us to provide state-of-the-art kit, so essentially a mobile intensive care in a state-of-the-art ambulance for babies and children who are in the wrong place for care that they need, really specialist care that could only be provided here for us to move them from another hospital in the east of England to here, keep them alive during that journey, for them to have the care they need, and really importantly, to take them back closer to home when they're better. We couldn't do that without your support. It transforms over 2,000 transfers every year who really need that critical care. So thank you very much for that. So I think we've just heard from two phenomenal speakers. I feel slightly intimidated coming up to speak after them. But the NHS does amazing things every day. We've just seen great examples of that. But it also has a huge impact on what we do every day. So around 1.7 million people have contact with the NHS every day. It's a phenomenal amount of people who depend on what we do. So we rely on it at the times of our greatest joy, times of our deepest sorrow, and everything in between. But I think we've all seen in the press, and it was really widely reported last week with a report by Lord Darcy, just how much the demand on the NHS is growing and that really the NHS is going to need to do things differently if we're really going to be able to support families, communities, and patients moving forward. So we do need to really think about how we transform and innovate to improve health and make sure the NHS is fit for the future. 
And I think Cambridge is uniquely well placed to do that and to do that with your support. So Cambridge has an extraordinary depth of clinical talent, and you've just heard that. And the strengths of the wider Cambridge environment offers huge potential for innovation. So we're co-located here uh, with industry in this beautiful building we are with AstraZeneca and many others, research and other NHS partners on the growing biomedical campus. It's huge now, I think, as many of us recognize over the last 20, 30, 40 years how much time, how much bigger it's become. And in fact, it's probably the largest center now of medical research and health science in the whole of Europe. It's absolutely uh, huge now. We're also really lucky to be co-located to so many other opportunities for life science industry and research just on our doorstep, which really unlocks massive possibilities for how we can change care. And our aspiration in Cambridge, certainly within the hospital, is to become an international leader in developing, implementing new knowledge solutions and technologies to deliver world-leading care for the benefit of our patients. So Rob will be pleased to see this. I've already imagined in this picture that the children's and cancer hospitals are built. I'm so confident in what they do and what they bring to transform the care in, in children and patients with cancer. But I think this just really highlights just the scale of, of where we are and, and the opportunity to work with so many different people to be able to really think about what's next, how do we keep pushing the boundaries, what do we do next, where do we go, how do we continue to innovate and transform care. So even within the hospital, we recognise we need to do something very different. And so we really started to create a dedicated innovation function. In fact, some of those uh, members of the team I see in the audience here, Emily, Colin, Paul, all absolutely central to the success of that uh, within the hospital. And we think this is because it will really benefit patients, but we also know we need to be more focused, more structure to increase pace on really what we're doing. We know there's so much opportunity to do it, but we need to be really organised in how we do that. As I said, if we don't, we know we face a continued increase in demand and a shortfall in the capacity that we've got. So thinking differently is absolutely key. And actually, innovation is about making a step change, just not a small change. So we need to be making small changes every day, but we need to make that step change. And we've heard two great examples of how we can do that to really transform care. And so we're developing a sort of innovation function within a hospital to really start to coalesce around these great ideas. And I've got some examples of where we can really begin to accelerate some of those opportunities. And you'll see there just some of the ideas that people within the hospital have already started to put forward. So these are things people know they want to do or already starting to do. So virtual wards. So patients who are no longer needing the care of being in hospital, but then need the support of the hospital clinicians to keep them and get them well, can go home and have their care continued at home. Now imagine if you're being in your own home, in your own space, in your own bed, with your own family, what a difference that makes to your recovery. And yet we can support you remotely, both in terms of how we contact you with telepho telephones, through video technology, and indeed we can monitor you through some of the equipment we can now use. That really changes things for patients. And we've seen that patients really like that and they get better sooner. I'm going to talk a bit more about the Children's um, Hospital and the Cancer Research Hospital. I think there are great examples how we're really thinking differently about healthcare we can provide. But again, there's lots of new things coming down the line that I think are really excited. People get terrified about AI, but there are real opportunities thinking about this carefully, thoughtfully, including patients and how we use it to really think about how we can accelerate some of the changes that we could offer for our patients. So this is how I see the real privilege of working with all of you. So we've got, I think in CUH, amazing clinical talent. I say I feel quite intimidated by uh, the audience I'm standing alongside the other speakers tonight. It's great partnerships with the university and ARU. Really, really, really specialist services, genomics and a range of others. Two exciting new hospitals coming on stream and one of the most digitally advanced hospitals in the country. But with ACT, ACT's the only registered charity who's dedicated to supporting innovation within CUH. And it provides care way beyond what the NHS can offer alone. And it accelerates, it really accelerates the pace of change. So in partnership, I think that brings us four key things. Earlier access to latest technologies for our patients, better patient outcomes. I think 
We have a local impact, but impact beyond that, national and international in what we do. And I think it also really helps us recruit and retain really talented staff who are really motivated to work here. So I was quite blown away, and actually Shelley tells me this is not the total. Um, it's just, you know, that over the last five years, over six million just in research and innovation alone. That's absolutely breathtaking in terms of what a difference that makes to the hospital. For me, potentially the homegrown inventions, so people who've got good ideas, we can really nurture them and take them from an, a small seed of an idea right the way through to really changing care. And also bringing good ideas in. So where there are good ideas, how do we bring them into the hospital? How do we start to use them, support people, train people, and start to move them forward? And innovation comes in all sorts of different ways. Rob, I know that you're sitting in the audience and uh, talk to many of the people in here about this, but innovation can take many different forms. It can be large projects which are hugely impactful, like the Children's Hospital, innovation for a whole new way. So four key things, I think, that really stand out about that. The whole child, the whole community, the whole life, and the whole hospital. It could be children's. It could be another... Uh, big area, just like the cancer hospital, cancer research hospital. A couple of just things to really to pull out there, that it's really seeking to improve the integration of new research and innovation right into clinical practice and trying to move forward the proportion of cancers that are detected at the earliest stages to really increase the survival. And as Matt's just talked about more specifically in inflammatory bowel disease, but in a very similar way, precision medicine, so the right treatments for the right patients so they get better. But it isn't just about buildings. It's actually sometimes just about space. So your funding has really helped provide some space. And Paul's in the audience is uh, heading up the clinical and engineering department. So ACT funds supports Cambridge inventions from ideas through development through the clinical engineering innovation team. So this just shows a range of the different projects where people have got really good ideas, but they've got no space and no support to know how to do them. And Paul's team, supported by you, have really been able to take those ideas, and those ideas are now in practice, really changing people's lives. It can also be, as I said, about accelerating new ideas. So getting where there's good ideas, being able to move them forward quickly because there's some extra support to really uh, help drive that forward. So in this example that I just thought might resonate, donor livers were routinely discarded to minimize risk of recipient rejection but patients awaiting transplant can get progressively more ill and die. And there seems a real disconnect between what we need to do and what we're able to do. So the solution was liver perfusion machine that mimics the human body, providing, so really helping uh, the liver and supporting the liver. And CUH was the first transplant center in the UK to adopt this for patient use. And we're consequently doing more liver transplants. That's really secondary to having that support from ACT to really help uh, increase the opportunity for us to do that. But it's not all about technology. I've thrown you lots of examples about technology, clearly because digital's in my title, but actually there's lots of things that aren't about technology. Sometimes about doing things differently, and I think that's really important. So cancer treatments here can lead to side effects. And what we know is that regular exercise really does improve outcomes. So this was really supporting a guided exercise and education program um, open to all patients who have got cancer but really helping to support them and other patients with long-term conditions in reducing their ongoing risks and trying to improve their outcomes. And finally, things that we do here can make a difference, not just here, but much, much more widely than that. So you have an impact that is far beyond the support to the hospital. It supports patients, families, well beyond the reach of here. So this is a product called Digibis, which was essentially came out of the fact that many children in this case, but it could be older patients and patients out elsewhere, couldn't get to their ophthalmology appointments during COVID because it was very difficult for us to see all the patients we needed to see the way we had to work in the hospital. And what that could lead was to children having undiagnosed eye conditions that just got worse and worse and worse. So Digivis was a tool that one of the consultant pediatric ophthalmologists developed here, a good idea that she had that is now uh, really changing the care that we offer, to do the testing at home, to really support children, and then when that was recognised, to be able to bring them in or see them earlier for their clinic appointments, saving their sight. So again, a really good idea from someone who works with children every day, born out of some of the challenges of having to work differently, 
that now is not just available here, but really can start to impact children's lives all over the world. So finally, I think all that's really left to say is a huge thank you. I hope I've shown that your support makes a difference every day to so many people. I see that, I hear that when I walk around the hospital, but I genuinely believe there's so much more to do, and I believe with your help and your support, we can go farther, we can go faster, and we can improve care for our patients. Thank you. Can I invite you all to come and have a seat on the very swish chairs? They swivel around. Sue, that was fantastic. What I really liked, Sue, about your um, presentation was that many of the things you talked about have been subject matter for previous John Addenbrook lecture. <laughs> so this is my sixth. I've been here seven years. This is my sixth John Addenbrook lecture. And the liver perfusion machine, which you talked about, was one of the themes one year, which many of the familiar faces in the audience might remember. Um, and that actually was a device that was a brainchild of a member of the, the hospital team in Cambridge as well. So it was really great to see you talking about some of the things that we've shared with you previously from idea to inception phase. So thank you. Right, I'm going to sit down. Um, we've got someone, I think, who got the mic in the end? Alex. This is Alex Kavanagh, everybody. Uh, I'm going to big up his role as microphone holder. He... Um, he may well engage in conversation, he's going to kill me for this, um, as he comes around with the microphone. But if you do have questions, Alex has the microphone and I'd ask you to adopt the stance that we've been taught, which is to hold it very tightly, your elbow very tightly in at the side and just in front there uh, so that we can hear you. I forgot to say at the very beginning, we are recording tonight's um, presentation um, and this will be used again. So some of the slides which were very detailed, you'll have the opportunity to have an another look at um, and to be wowed all over again. So I will stop filling in while people think about questions. See if there are any. Oh, we've got one right at the front, Alex. Would you mind standing up and and that's that would be great for the is camera. That, is that working? That's perfect. Yeah, David Owen. Um, question about IBD. Ultra processed foods are the villain at the moment. Are they possibly implicated in the rise? Yeah, common question, common suggestion. Um, <clears throat> they might be. I I think um, it's difficult to predict what exactly in the multiple sort of environmental changes that our world has seen over that, say, a relatively short period of time. And by that, I mean, let's say the last hundred years. Um, the process or the processing of food and the type of food anyone consumes these days, I would agree, are such a fundamental change. And given that they have such a major impact on our bodies, I would agree with you that they may well be one of the culprits of this. Um, However, I, I'd say that I think that none of these things will sort of work in isolation. And, and we know that people are growing up happily eating only processed food and never get these diseases. Um, but I think there are part of a wider change. And that comes also, I think, another really important change, in my opinion, um, at least as dramatic as the, the stuff we eat, is, is the kind of um, microbes that we get exposed to or not. I think we would all agree that our environment has been becoming substantially more sterile. Um, and in fact, that also probably affects food. The type of food people have eat, were eating hundreds, let alone 500 years, is probably no comparison to what people eat this nowadays. But I, Totally agree with your suggestion, and I think that is a very good point. Alex, okay. Rebecca. Um, Would you mind standing up, Rebecca, for the camera? Sorry. <laughs> Just for those at home. 
Uh, Rebecca Wood, uh, I'm from the Evelyn Trust and from Tom's Trust, which is a, a children's brain tumour charity. I was just interested in what you were saying, Sue, about you know the digital angle, um, but I wondered if it was also the consideration about the way charities work together. So um, lots of in the Cambridgeshire area, but also all over the UK, where you've got dedicated smaller charities that work directly with hospitals and how that could be helpful in terms of getting people uh, uh, to uh, get back out of hospital and into the community. So that link uh, there, whether that had been considered in terms of things like contracts, all sorts of things, the way that the NHS can work with those providers. So thank you. So I think I think absolutely those are the kind of things that we're really keen to explore. Is it's it's more than just the hospital and you know. ACT has been brilliant in, in, in supporting quite a lot of what we do. But as you say, there's other charities which have other areas where they complement what we do. And one of the things we're really keen to is that how do, we, how do we do that to provide the best care we can to the patients we're looking after, whether they're in the hospital or outside of the hospital? And I absolutely, I think we would welcome those conversations with other charities say, what does that look like? How can we work with you and, and how can you support us to try and do the right thing for our patients? That was a difficult one to answer in front of the CEO of ACT, I know. isn't it? Did, did, I'm I could please. sense that you weren't <laughs> too comfortable. It's fine. We do have lots of charities that provide really valuable services to the hospital, including in paediatrics, we have the giggle doctors and the laughter specialists yeah. that ACT also provide funding to in order to help ensure those services come to the, the children. So don't worry. I know you're loyal. <laughs> Alex, go ahead. Nikki Marion. Um, I've been reading that children who weren't, didn't have access to antibiotics during COVID, partly because they weren't getting sick and partly because they just couldn't get hold of them, seem to have stronger guts um, going forward. Are you finding, is it too early to comment on that? Another excellent point. And there is a recent study that came out from Sweden. And I mean, these studies are always a bit um, need to be taken with caution because we're talking about associations. That's not necessarily a proof of um, a consequence, but they also found that early exposure to antibiotics can increase your risk of, of inflammatory bowel diseases. So again, these are environmental factors. Um, in this case, they will have major impact on our gut microbiota. So on the bacteria that happen to live in our intestine very early on in life. And every course of antibiotic that a child receive early on in life will have an impact on what's ultimately going to end up in their gut. And with that, they'll also have an impact on how healthy or not their inner lining of the gut will be. So again, it, it makes to me very good sense. How to address that is a different question. I was reflecting, Ken, um, I'm not a scientist, but I was reflecting that when I was at school, I used to um, miss science to fill up the vending machine and I was raising money to buy the first ever computers in my school. And it was a bit ironic in my mind that here I am fundraising and listening to all this science rather than participating. That's a prelude to me asking a rather dumb question, <laughs> showing that I'm not a scientist. But how about these um, external factors like, you know, you now use drugs to grow bones and things like that. You know, we've got a gut in a dish. What, what do those external factors impact on the disease areas you look after? That's, uh, that is a good question. We have um, difficulties in bone um, with using organoid and similar systems because bone lives quite deep and it hasn't got much oxygenation. Uh, and added to that, you have to be using your skeleton in order for it to be healthy. And so it needs a lot of um, stimulation and People have tried to make devices that simulate walking and crush little specimens of bone in order to keep them alive. But our little, our little similar organoid um, uh, science doesn't go very well because the cells in them start to die quite quickly. They're very unhappy, even if you give them all the right nutrients. And I was really, uh, I'm really jealous that he can grow these things in a couple of days because our bones won't do that. That's the best answer I can give. 
Great. See, I'm not a scientist. Uh, Alex, down the front. Uh, my, sorry. Thank my, you. My name is Hafid Alata, and I'm wondering how do you choose what research to support? Because it seems to me that there are some uh, areas where uh, <laughs> not only you don't do, but actually uh, doctors don't know about, yeah. for instance, Tietze. Very often they say, what is it? But it is a, a disease and the number of people suffer. Thank you. I'm going to give an answer about how ACT um, dishes out its funding, but maybe I'll call on my research. Oh, would you like to take it before I do the ACT bit? Okay, I'm just going to say that from an ACT perspective, we um, have a research advisory panel. It has 26 members on its panel and they're consultants from across a range of, of health specialities in the hospital and the university. And they receive the applications and review them and then advise us on the projects that they think are good and, and, and valuable for funding, or it might be about individuals uh, like a, a Dan on the front row here, who they believe are going to become great researchers in their career and show great promise with their, um, you know, their question for, for studies. So um, we take the advice of the hospital in terms of those projects, and we do support across a wide range. I think the challenge becomes uh, really about the available funding that we have and we, we, we're very lucky to receive significant legacies for research. We're very lucky that we receive funding to help the hospital's greatest need. That enables us to respond to those areas. And we're very lucky to have had in the past campaigns which have raised money for particular um, programs like the Personalised Breast Cancer Programme, many of you will know about. We gave sh just short of £2 million to that project and the team have gone on to do amazing things. Their 500 study became many thousands of people and we know that they've gone on to raise £19 million in additional funds, probably over that, that was last year's number, um, to do more for, for breast cancer. And Sue said herself that personalised medicine is the way forward. So um, it, it really is um, a, a, a family affair when it comes to research. We work very closely with our esteemed colleagues. And it wasn't hard to pick who to have on the audience tonight because the three of them met with me in fairly quick succession and I could see the wonder in the stories that they would be sharing. Um, Matt came to talk about the, the children's proposition to the campaign board for the children's hospital. Ken came to tell me how pleased he was with his Phoenix study and, and uh, was, was just updating me, and Sue and I were talking about some innovation work. So it, it, you know, we really do talk and stay very close to our hospital colleagues. Ken, I've given you time to think. That, yeah, well, I, I think that was a really insightful question because you're asking about how do people come with the idea and then get picked up. And one, another hat that I wear is from the NIHR, the NHS research arm, National Institute for Health Research, and we're here in the Biomedical Research Center, and I lead with another group of colleagues, the capacity theme. And it's really dear to us that the people who are working directly with the patients, with, you said SETC, but there are other, many conditions. That it's not always the boffin academic who has the idea that can change the practice. And one of our things we're trying to encourage is nursing, midwifery, allied health professionals such as Dan to come along with their ideas and then they come to for instance, the sort of seed funding and pump priming initiatives that are supported both by Adam Brooks Charter Press and the NIHR. And we're looking very closely at those. When you're in those meetings, they're extraordinary because people are really looking, can this person get the next grant? Can they get the next PhD studentship? Can they develop their idea? Are they in the right environment to develop that idea? And then can it go somewhere? And it's, a, it's one of my favorite um, places to be, especially the pump priming fellowships of one year that take people who've just got an idea and they say, right, in a year's time, you're going to put this out for a proper um, MRC or, a, you know, a major funding body. And we want that to come from anybody who has an idea across the hospital. Alistair. Uh, 
Uh, Alastair Massarella, um, forgive my ignorance, I'm an electronics engineer, so I've got a question. I've got two questions, actually, because it's quite hard to get in for a question. So um, first one is to Dan, is um, with all the CAT scans and x-rays, how are you ingesting all those, and how can you scale that for the, the whole of the country? Is it a manual process, or is it in, in terms of looking at those scans to, to look for the, um, the, the spinal fractures? We, could I ask you to answer about the AI tool as well that's across the country? Well, I wasn't expecting to be sitting here, in more honesty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I came as a guest. Um, There's no yes. free lunch here, is there? <laughs> uh, so um, I'm working with a um, cross-departmental um, national study of um, working with an AI company that specializes in finding vertebral fractures from CT scans. Uh, and with the aim of automatically feeding that into a fracture liaison service. And that's a department within the hospital which is dedicated to finding vertebral fractures and trying to put people under treatment. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is trying to find a better way of doing that. Because if you did give the FLS all these vertebral fractures, it would overwhelm them. So part of the project what I'm doing, which is involves the VXP, program which I'm uh, trying to lead is trying to really pinpoint those who desperately need care straight away. So it's really prioritizing the patients who are really going to benefit from the treatments that Ken mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's one way of trying to get all these national, all these big national CT studies all focused into one place. And I didn't catch the second part of your question. I, I was going to say with regard to as also, as Dan says, but you, they install a server now and it just runs. So it, it is a hospital-based server, but it, the scary thing is when you turn it on and as you say about scaling up, you become overwhelmed very quickly. So any, if you are given 850 new patients in three months, which we were with the AI tool, uh, you have to ask, well, what's it finding? Is it finding it as well as we are? We're in that phase of scaling up at the moment, because not everything that AI thinks is a disease or a fracture in our case is actually a fracture. And there's an awful lot of work. It's, sim, you know, it's skimming them down. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of my work is in the machine learning side. So it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the training data and the test data. So I was, there's probably some further questions on how you're actually doing that, which is really interesting, but probably not for tonight. My second question is on organoids. Um, I think you, you said that the Crohn's disease was maybe a, the immune system attacking the, the, the colon. So when you take the organoid out and you grow it in a dish, how do you simulate the immune system attacking the organoid so you can see the effectiveness of uh, whatever treatment you're trying to develop? Firstly, we're able to core culture the inner lining of the gut, the epithelium, with immune cells right. to look at the interaction. Um, but one of the fundamental questions that still no one is able to answer is what's activating the immune system in the first place. And if that part, what's activating, why is that not going away? Because when we dampen down the immune system, giving immunosuppressive treatment, you know, in the lucky patients, the disease sort of dampens down and, and the inflammation goes away, but it comes back. That suggests that something isn't going away. And what we found and recently published is that within the epithelium, there is a pathway called, called MHC class one that is capable of activating immune system. And we found that that pathway is epigenetically regulated and is stable throughout. And that could explain why the disease doesn't go back. And it could explain why the disease is where it is, which is in the gut, whereas the immune systems can circulate. They can go anywhere in the body. So the organoids give us a lot of information and they could potentially even answer what's the underlying cause of the inflammation at that specific anatomical site. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. Stay there. Sorry, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I hope, oh, have we got another question? Or, oh, we've got one at the front, Simon. Oh, I've got one at the front first then. Come on, stand up, Simon. Be great. Hi, uh, Simon Chapman. I've actually got three very quick ones for each speaker. <laughs> so, so speaker number one, you said that it was all curable now uh, on the back. Is that just drugs or are there other treatments? For speaker number two, is it just a matter of time for your vision to come true? And for speaker number three, 
Um, the NHS is a big organisation with a lot of people. So with all the innovation in the world, do you actually have the leadership to deliver what you need to do? I got the easy one there. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, you can think for a while. I, I, I did take a very um, positive spin on some of the new medications, which I think we couldn't have even conceived when I started work uh, here, that you could put 25% bone density into someone's skeleton in a year, right? But in terms of what we talk about in terms of maintaining and improving bone health, at least half comes from lifestyle, exercise, and um, nutrition, and that includes vitamin D. And you, you only have to look at people who are immobile or who don't get any vitamin D to know that it's a complete package. And we, I'm a little bit more holistic in clinic, if you ever see me. Uh, so great question, and no, we, we, it's not completely a cured condition. Okay, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and answer this. You know, um, so, so you know, the, the NHS is complex. You're right, and it's and it's absolutely not without its challenges. But I think one of the greatest opportunities um, where good leadership is is about really empowering and unlocking the potential of our staff and our teams who we work with every day. That's what good leadership, I think, will do. It will really see what we see here, what I see every day, really talented staff doing amazing things. That's a great place to... Uh, to... Oh, we've got one more question. I'm so sorry, I forgot. Please stand up. A question. Adrian Dixon, Ken Paul kindly gave me a plug. <laughs> I wanted to say how refreshing it was to see three young... Uh, consultants acknowledging the support that they get from charity and philanthropic donations. That has been absolutely fundamental at Addenbrooke's. 42 years ago, the townspeople raised money for a CT scanner in this hospital. It was opened by Prince Charles, as he was then. But I just wanted to tease Ken, because when you next see Camilla, you may not know that her father, Bruce Shand, was chair of the Smith Charity and he gave about 100, or managed to find 150,000 pounds to the Addenbrooke's uh, Cancer Scanner Thank Appeal you. Fund, the forerunner of ACT. So just thank him for that, would you please? <laughs> And actually, Adrian, I say this with the whole of my heart. We talk about you regularly in the charity as one of the founding fellows of charitable giving at the hospital. And we all know that John Adambrook left money in his will, but you and the team with John Phillips, we talk about the taxi driver slash council man who went to raise a million pounds because his mate was being sent to Norfolk of all places to have a, uh, a body scan and Cambridge must of course uh, have one. And um, it's a story we do tell regularly. So I'm thrilled that you're here this evening. Um, I'm thrilled that you've stood up so everybody could see you. And I thank you for the, the legacy you've enabled me to carry on. So thank you. Big round of applause. I think it leaves me to say that it's so lovely to see you all this evening. I hope you have enjoyed the, the conversation as much as I have. And I'm so grateful for your being here. The surprise edition of Dan, uh, which is fantastic. But you can put this on your CV now, Dan. Uh, my team also know who you are. There is lots of ACT team here who will be delighted to talk to you a bit more about the work that we're doing. Um, we have mentioned both the cancer and the children's hospital. It does remain at the heart of our vision, but so does helping the hospital and all of the other areas that need love and attention. We have got Rob Hirschgall, who's the clinical director of the children's hospital here tonight. I'm sure he'll stay for a, uh, what are they called? Finger bites. Finger bites and uh, a glass of wine. Um, and we'll be happy to talk to you about what what's happening with the Cambridge Children's Hospital. There'll be more events to bring you up to speed on those new hospital builds, but we thought we'd take a pause and really just talk about research because research is going to be at the heart of both the new hospitals. Richard Gilbertson was here earlier, but he had to duck out and Richard and I 
um, were this morning with a donor very early and Richard told a great story, which I feel I shouldn't really tell now he's not here. Um, but I'll, I'll save that for next time. But I, I know he would have been keen to talk to you also about the progress with the cancer hospital. Suffice to say, we are making progress. They will be built. There will be two new hospitals. They will change the lives of cancer patients and of children. And you'll all be part of it. And I look forward to celebrating with you and being able to stand up like Adrian and say, me and my band of 40,000 ACT supporters have made this all possible. So I thank you wholeheartedly for being here. It really is lovely to see you. I thank you for listening. And I thank each and every one of the speakers for giving their time. And also the hospital staff that have snuck in. It's nice to see you. We've mentioned uh, Paul from Clinical Engineering. Paul's a great supporter of ACT, but he also innovates in the hospital um, in his sleep, in his waking, on his holidays, on his sick bed, um, because people are committed here to making things better for patients, and that's made possible by the help of you. So thank you, and I look forward to catching up with you outside to enjoy the refreshments of AstraZeneca. And just a little insider note, their cafe is open to the public, and their coffee is cheap and tasty. <laughs> Don't tell too many people because then it might not be tasty and cheap any longer. So um, do enjoy the refreshments. Do mingle and meet one another and do talk to the Adam Brooks um, Charitable Trust team. And thanks to the team for all your organisation. Okay, good night.